Hello, my name is Pastor Alfred Fuka Tofibam, and I'd like to welcome you to the teaching ministry of the Way of Life Tabernacle established here in Cameroon. And I welcome those of you who are listening to this broadcast uh, outside of Cameroon. It's my privilege to bring the Word of God to you. And my intention this day, and I invite you to tune in at the same time every day and also at 9.30 p.m., uh, Cameron time to listen to this teaching. Uh, my goal is to help you to actually know what the Bible teaches. One of the difficult things that we have in Christianity today is that most people, when they want to listen to you, they are already coming thinking about what they want you to say. And Paul warned that this was going to be the case in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and following, that in the last days men will not endure sound doctrine, but they will take people who will tell them what they want to hear, who would tickle their ears. I don't want to tickle your ears. I want you to know what the Bible teaches. And this day, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to go through the Gospels. Um, Jesus taught for a period of three and a half years on earth, 2,000 years ago, and his teaching is recorded in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, record the stories uh, of Jesus' life in a very similar way. And we're going, to, we're going to see that, how each of them presents Jesus Christ. And uh, last time we had looked at, uh, hopefully you still remember, or if you're just tuning in for the first time, we had looked at the religious groups or parties that existed in the days of Jesus. You can't miss it as you read the Gospels that there are several groups of religious people who are, whom Jesus come in contact, who are fiercely opposed to Jesus. You know, we had the Sadducees who were wealthy religious people who did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels and they believe that uh, they believe in fate. That is, if you're poor, you're poor because, well, you were destined to be poor. And then we had the Sadducees who were very, uh, also very religiously conservative. In fact, they were like the evangelicals of our day. They were Bible believing. And, but they had an issue. The issue was that they added a lot to the Bible, so much so that their tradition was now having more uh, strength than the Bible. And they were the most, uh, uh, the greatest enemies of Jesus, as we will see in the Gospels. And then we're going to find out, so why were they, if they were that religious, if they were that reading the Bible, why were they so opposed to Jesus? And is that a trap that we can fall into even today? Is it possible that if Jesus was teaching down the street, you are going to say, no, I'm not going to go there because he's not doing that. He's not doing that. He's not promising that. He's not promising this. The Bible says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. Now, as we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. If I was to ask you, what is the good news of the kingdom of God? Oh, what is the kingdom of God? Do you know? Would you be able to answer? As a way of introduction here, I'm going to be going through the gospel of Matthew, and then I'm going to link it would mark and look because they record Jesus' story in a similar fashion and some of the passages uh, are the same or just different in a very uh, uh, very slightly so what is the kingdom of god for one when jesus came into the synagogue in his native town in capernaum it says that he went up to read from the scripture and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he opened 
to the passage where it, the following is written. He opened to Isaiah 61. I've actually opened my Bible to Isaiah 61, but I'm going to quote what he said in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. Jesus said that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, to preach release from prison for the captives, and for the deliverance of the oppressed. And then to declare the year of God's favor. And then he closed the Bible or the scripture or the scroll and gave it to the attendant who was standing there. And then told the people, this day, this scripture is fulfilled before your very eyes. So we're going to look at Isaiah. And what we're going to do as we're looking through the book of Matthew wherever we will see a quotation from the old testament we are going to go over there in the old testament to see the context of what was being quoted and then see what was going to follow after that quotation because there are things that are recorded in the old testament about the first and second coming of christ and mostly what is quoted to us is what was to happen in his first coming like what Jesus did here when he read Isaiah 61 I'm going to go over there and then I will read it to you Isaiah 61 verse 1 and following it says the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me that's the same passage that he read in Luke because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, oh, the oppressed, to proclaim the year of God's favor. So he stopped there. This is the message that Jesus came to preach, to release the poor from poverty, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for those who are captive one of the things that happens today as we preach the gospel is that most people just focused on salvation yes Jesus died to give us salvation but he came to give us much more than salvation we'll cover those as we go along and see so just to just for your interest here the second part of the verse that Jesus did not read says the following. And so he came to, let me go back. He says, to proclaim the year of God's favor. He stopped there. The next part is, and the day of the vengeance of our God. So the day of favor has been 2,000 years of the preaching of the gospel, which is going to end with the day of vengeance of our God. So the 2000 years of the existence of the church is like not even, it's, it's a bracket, it's filled between two words, between the year of God's favor and then and the word end, which introduces the day of vengeance of our God. And then what follows after the day of vengeance of our God, which is the declaration of the good news of the kingdom. Then he says that to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. This is what is going to happen after the day of vengeance, after the day of judgment. So this is what is coming. And we are going to come back to this passage when we start talking of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. So, uh, back here to Matthew chapter 1, that's where we're going to start. So, I say here in my notes that the Gospels are a record of Jesus' teaching and ministry for about three and a half years. Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record a similar, in, in a similar manner with a harmony of many of the accounts. Mark is thought to have been written first. And seems to be the source of Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. 
And so as we continue in this teaching, as I've already said, when we cover a passage in Matthew, we will also cover the similar story in Mark and in Luke. So that when we go through the book of Matthew, we would have gone through all these three Gospels. In theology, yeah, they call it the synoptic Gospels, which means they record almost the same thing. And so John is a little different. He records the ministry of Jesus in a slightly different way, focusing more on the identity of Jesus as the Son of God, as God in the flesh dwelling amongst us. And so I've said here, uh, I will summarize the themes of the four Gospels as follows here. Matthew, so Jesus is the Son of God. He emphasizes that he is the promised Messiah. He is the promised Messiah, the anointed one, the one that is going to be king. And we see this right in Matthew chapter 2. And he is the one who fulfills the Old Testament predictions. Now we will note that throughout the Gospel of Matthew, the word fulfill comes up over and over and over and over again. So Matthew is trying to prove to us that this Jesus is a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament or of the scriptures as it, is, it was called then. So we are going to see the word fulfill over and over. Then Mark seems uh, uh, portrays Jesus as the Son of God, the miracle worker. So he focuses more on the miracles of Jesus and his power over nature. Then in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is clearly seen as the Savior of the world. Now notice that these things are also in the other Gospels, but each uh, Gospel writer have this particular way in which they are presenting Jesus Christ. So Jesus is seen as the Savior in the book of Luke, the Son of Man who is seeking after the lost. He is seeking after those who are the outcast in society, those who are rejected. So if you feel like you have been rejected in society, that nobody cares for you, the best gospel for you to start reading is the gospel of Luke. And it demonstrates to us that nobody can be too sinful for Jesus to save. Don't exclude yourself because you think that you have been a terrible person. Jesus reaches out to the worst of sinners. You can be saved no matter how sinful you have been. That is the good news. That is how Jesus is demonstrated in the book. Of Luke or in the gospel of Luke. Yes, you cannot be too sinful to be saved by Jesus. There is no sin that Jesus cannot forgive except the sin of refusing to come to him because he cannot force somebody to be saved. Salvation is free, but you have to come to take it, to receive it. You have to repent and to receive Jesus. So, as I've said, John presents Jesus as the Son of God, as the Word of God, the Word of God that has been made flesh, and for eternal life, we must believe in Him. Now, I focus on the Gospel of John on Tuesday, so you can tune in on Tuesday and also see who Jesus is from the perspective of John. So we're basically doing all the four Gospels in these teachings. And what I will do as I will teach here is, you know, uh, at the end of Matthew, Jesus commands the disciples say, Go ye into all the world, and as you go, make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And we are also going to see that a true disciple of Jesus is someone who obeys the commands of Jesus. So what I'm going to do as we go through the Gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke, I will point out to you things that are clearly visible 
as direct commands for you to do. And then I'm also going to develop some principles that you can apply to your life. Okay, now, and I've said, let's look at the book of Matthew. So Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Guess what we call the genealogy of Jesus. It is the family line of Jesus. Proving that he is the son of Abraham, that he is the son of David. Remember, in the Old Testament, David was promised that a son will come from his own loins. He will have a descendant who will sit on his throne and establish his kingdom forever and ever. So Matthew is showing here that this Jesus, this anointed one, O Messiah, is that son of David that was going to come. And then the second half here, we're going to just look at the report of how Jesus was born. I'm going to read a summary and then I'm going to come back and then we'll read the text itself. Matthew himself was one of the 12 disciples. And before Jesus called him who was a tax collector. <laughs> no, something you should note here is tax collectors in the days of Jesus were considered the worst of sinners because they they were some of them were Israelites but they lived under the colonial rule of Rome and some of them were collecting taxes for Rome it is like uh, this is going to be tough it is like us having our rulers in Africa who are ruling their countries not for the interest of Africans they are ruling the countries for the interest of European companies and European nations that is how tax collectors kind of were so they were Israelites but they were collecting money from the Israelites and giving it to the Romans so they were really really hated what is the point I'm trying to make here I'm trying to make here that although Matthew was hated because he was a tax collector, Jesus went closer to him and saved him and even made him his disciple. So, no one is too sinful to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was not only a disciple, he was one of the apostles. And I've said here that Matthew writes his gospel with the background of the Old Testament, proving over and over that Jesus is the one who came to fulfill the predictions of the prophets. And there's a lot of those predictions. I was thinking about that, that I may do a presentation that will cover the direct uh, references about Jesus in the Old Testament, I, I summarized them out and there's like about 72 of them, specific mentions of Jesus in the Old Testament. In, after the resurrection in the Gospel of Luke, it is said that Jesus appeared to some two disciples that were going to the root at Emmaus. And he was talking with them and they did not know that it was Jesus it says that he opened their eyes and explained to him from the scriptures who the Christ was and how he was going to suffer and then be taken into glory so there is much spoken about Jesus in the Old Testament and I just want to ask you do you know that do you ever read your Old Testament do you actually read the whole Bible it's my challenge to you in this year 2024 read through the bible don't just listen to me don't just listen to any pastor don't just read, listen to any priest don't just listen to any prophet don't just listen to any man of god pick up the bible and read it for yourself the holy spirit will teach you and you will understand and you will not be moved back and forth by the teachings of men but you will be grounded in the very word of god the key concept 
as we have mentioned here in the teachings of Jesus, is the kingdom of God and the good news about that kingdom. The good news about that kingdom. We just saw a little bit in Isaiah 61 how oh, the things that were going to happen when Jesus comes back to comfort those who mourn. And there's many other things there, but we're not going to read that today. So in Matthew chapter 18, beginning from uh, verses, uh, Matthew 1, beginning from verse 18, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. This is a story that most of us have read. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. You know, in Israel, according to the Bible, you cannot sleep with a man or sleep with a woman if you're not married. In the Old Testament, if you lose your virginity, not your husband, you are stoned to death. We live in the age of grace, but that doesn't mean that if you live in that immorality or you live in fornication, you're going to go to heaven. No, you will not go to heaven. And when you go to hell, there will be no fornication there either. You will just have lost both ways. So, if you're living in fornication, please repent. Repent and receive forgiveness that you may have eternal life. So, he, because Mary was pregnant while they had not been together, that was a scandal. But Joseph did not want to expose her, so he was thinking to divorce her just quietly or put her away quietly. So, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David. Well, there's an importance. He said, Joseph, son of David, making reference to make sure that, yes, this is Jesus is coming from the line of David. Um, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. We're going to come back to that. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to her son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Okay, this is very important here to understand. Uh, number one. It said here that she gave birth to a son and uh, she will give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from his sins. So Jesus means Savior. And I want you to understand that his name Jesus has not always been Jesus, N not until 500 years ago. Now, understand this very clearly. I know that this may be a difficult teaching. Like, what? No. You, if you know the Old Testament, you know that one of the books in the Old Testament is called Joshua. Joshua is the same name as Jesus. So the English Bible kind of confuses us. Why is the same name Joshua and Jesus? Effectively, that name is Yeshua. Yeshua. Because even up until the 500 years ago, the y, there was no J in the English language. So it is Yeshua. And it means to save. So the name Yeshua means to save or oh, Yah saves or oh, you would say Yahweh saves or oh, Jehovah saves I prefer to go just with Yah so Jesus means Yah saves and the name Jesus means Yeshua 
and in the most recent years most people have gone back to the bible to study these things and say well the name actually is not jesus but it is yeshua or yehoshua so we know that then verse 22 say this took place to fulfill what the prophet the lord has said through the prophet i told you that matthew is going to use this word fulfill a lot to point to the fact that in isaiah 7 it was prophesied that a virgin will be a child and they will name this child Yeshua, which means saved. And then it also say that his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus is God in the flesh among us. Stay tuned and we will continue with Matthew chapter 2 next time when we do this broadcast. Thank you.